Hi, Mark Rubeau. Hi, Fiona. Welcome to Backstage at Cap U. Thanks for having me. So happy to, to, to have you here in person. Yeah. Well, congratulations on, on your book, Mark. Thank you. I, did, I read it. I devoured it in, in, in a weekend. I have to say I really, oh. really, really enjoyed it. Ransom Stories of a Noise Guitarist. So great title. Uh, I grew up in Newfoundland uh, where they like to rant. Oh, yeah. There's a song, most famous song, We'll rant and we'll roar like true Newfoundlanders. Ah. So they like a good rant. <laughs> okay. Tell me how this came together to be published during the pandemic. I know you wrote a lot of it prior, but so did it give you time to compile what you wanted to put in this book? Or uh, Well, you know, being a musician is like a lot like being, it's one of those jobs like Merchant Marine where you have a lot of downtime. You know, it's, um, I've been very lucky in that I've done a lot of my touring on train in Europe, which is very peaceful. Yeah. And, you don't get car sick if you read or write, you know, so, um, yeah. So I've just, over the years, written, just written a lot of you stuff. You always have a journal with you, I assume. Yeah, yeah. or for the last 30 years, a computer. But, um, yeah, I, I try to, yeah, I just write stuff down. Um, and then I had a lot of stuff. You have such a great 40-year career. Like you're, you're, it's all over the map. Um, but your foundation, your first lessons with the great Haitian classical composer, Franz Kaseyevs, who was in New York. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear how that came about and how has that uh, shaped you as an artist? I mean, it was kind of random that I wound up studying with Fra Franz. It's, it, it's not that I had any talent for or real interest in classical guitar music, but Franz was a friend of my family's. He was always at holidays, you know, like when I when I was a, I was a kid. He had left Haiti, um, and I mean he 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 was tight with his brother. Eventually moved to New York, but he he wasn't really. He was a little estranged from his own family because he'd kind of dropped out of law school in Haiti to become a classical guitarist, oh. which wasn't really seen as a very sensible move, you know, in Haiti in the nineteen thirties uh, and forties. So. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, there was, I, I suspect there was a bit of tension there. So, yeah, he was happy to have people to hang out with on the holidays. And, and so when I decided that I want, I just wanted to learn guitar because I got braces and it hurt to play trumpet. And, um, and because I was starting to listen to the radio and I noticed that the Rolling Stones didn't have many guitars trumpets in their <laughs> music and I wanted to be like Keith Richards like you know. really <laughs> yeah sure uh, who did but you know they said well you need you want to study guitar Franz needs students so you're studying with Franz yeah so it was in a way a total accident but um it turned out to be a very fortuitous accident uh because you know first of all I mean Franz was the first person who I heard play guitar live you know, he, I guess he must have been bored because when he'd come to family events, he'd bring his guitar and sit there and practice, yeah. you know. Um, um, everybody else in my family found it much more interesting to argue about politics. But Franz, and were you listening to what he was playing? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, you, were you know, I was just that. kind of fascinated by it, yeah. like from the time I was six. Um, but, but. Yeah, so he he was around. I took lesson, lessons with him for three years, and he was a very understanding teacher. In other words, he didn't hit me heavy with the technique, like in classic, as is the common classical music uh, method, method to beat people over the head with that right off the bat. Right. You know, he figured out oh, the kid will probably quit soon, anyways. Um, and and so he made it fun for you. Then. Yeah. Well, yeah. he said, you know, what is what does a eleven, twelve year old kid want? Teach him some tunes to impress his friends, you know. Um, and he was pretty right about that, you know. So you and learned he fing finger style, like class yeah, classical. Yeah, that's right. I started finger style, but and I immediately was using it to play in garage bands in New Jersey. <laughs> So how did that work out, playing fingerstyle guitar? Well, you know, for up and I didn't actually learn to play with a pick until I was like, started to be like 
I don't know, until I was like 20. Wow. Yeah, 20, 21. Because like for, for a long time, I thought, okay, I'm going to play electric guitar, but finger style, you know. And it was, I'm going to be the one to change this stuff around, okay. you know. Like, um, which was a mixture of laziness and ambition that kind of, well, you'll see evidence of that later in, the, in many areas <laughs> of this covered um, in area, many areas of my life. But, um, you know, so I thought I was going to do this great new thing. And it worked out really great for about the first 20 minutes of, of a gig if I hadn't been playing in a while. I could play amazingly until the metal strings broke my fingernails oh, off. Oh, God. And then, <laughs> my, Jeez. and then my, uh, you know, then my speed and accuracy went down about <laughs> 60%. Your bleeding fingers, like you just, just that, well, no, just broken. You know, they're all callous and all, but the fingernails on the right hand are, anyways, I don't want to get nerdy, but you need them to play. Classical, yeah. 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 <laughs> You you played finger style last night. At, I was blessed yeah. to be at your ironwork show. And yeah, for some reason this guitar doesn't break them that much, or for some reason I don't care as much now. <laughs> <laughs> now I've kind of adopted if 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 I'm having if I break my fingernails, I just play slower, hmm. and it's okay. There's there was one quote in here that um, you called uh, guitar is the essential instrument of blues so I was interested in that in that statement and maybe how because I heard I heard a lot of acoustic blues coming out or in, in what you were playing last night as well as the stuff from Franz and you were all over the map lots of jazz as well yeah well it's the ADD but um See. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah for me it has a kind of unity even though it's all over the map um but maybe that's just me. But um, yeah, that, that quote about guitar being the essential instrument of blues, you know, I was, um, comes from a piece where I was talking about how guitar is associated with sadness, you know, blues, Acaso's blue period, he's always talking about, always, you know, pa painting guitarists looking decrepit. And then, you know, if you go back to the very first guitar hero, is uh, John Dowland and the name of his hit tune, you know, like, what, 15th century or something like that. Um, I mean, lute player, actually. But the name of John Dowland, is a uh, big hit tune was, um, I mean, if, if they, to the extent they had big hit tunes before they had recordings, yeah. um, was John Dowland is always sad. Oh, wow. <laughs> John Dowland is Semper, uh, Semper Dolans, I think, yeah. Ah, so I'm curious for going from your lessons with Franz to you getting into the music scene. You moved to New York City in the late 70s? Um, early yes, yeah. late 70s. So um, a lot's been written about the scene in New York at that time. I met a lot of the people who were involved in the punk scene like later. You know, I mean, I, I saw Richard Hell um, at CBGB's not long after I, I came over, just because I went to CBGB's and there Richard Hell was. Yeah. You know? I read um, his, his, his Yeah, yeah, uh, his, his book is his great. His book, yeah. So when I came to New York, I came from, I'd been living in Maine, and so I was really out of it. You know, I'd been playing in bands up there. Maine, but, so from Jersey you went to Maine? And then, Jersey. Because you were born. Uh, I stayed in Boston long enough to kind of flunk out of school, and then I I um, moved to Maine. I met a woman um, in Boston who, for no apparent reason, wanted to move to Maine. I was three years in Maine, but um, that was when I started really working as a uh, professional, <laughs> quote unquote, musician. You know. So what musical styles were you uh, involved I was, with? You know, like we were, we would have been a top four. In Maine, um, in Maine, the bands that I were in there would have been top 40 bands if we'd been smart enough to know what the top 40 was. So 
I don't know, I was in a band uh, called Papa Scrunch and like one guy, um, one guy in it was like a kind of displaced disco dude from, uh, from Alabama. I remember we played The Hustle, you know, oh, and yeah. that came along yeah. and some Stevie Wonder tunes and then a few Grateful Dead tunes and then Long Train Running by the Doobie Brothers. <laughs> At one point, I think we bought matching outfits uh, to try to play at Holiday Inns, but then, I don't know, we could never <laughs> find them. Or <laughs> Well, you got a version of The Hustle with the young Philadelphians. Yeah, right? I, yeah. well, I got my revenge like years later, you know, um, where I got to do my own version of The Hustle. Yeah, yeah, it was cool. I love that project. I did see that. I did see you play with the young Philadelphians in New ah, York. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I love that project, too. You know, when I came to, first came to New York from Maine, it seemed, you know, like the gigs, the work in Maine was like top 40 type work. That's what you played or, you know, or you imitated some rock band mostly. There was a few quasi original bands, but it wasn't about originality. It was about playing at a place where people dance. Yeah. I looked on like jazz as the music of freedom, you know, like where you get to do what you want, yeah. you know. Um, or so I thought. But then when I actually hit New York, so I, I was trying to be a jazz player. I wasn't particularly good at it, but that's what I, that's what I thought I wanted, yeah. you know. Um, uh, I got like a few gigs doing that. Um, like I played with Brother Jack McDuff for about four months. <laughs> But he, he usually yelled at me. <laughs> he yeah. hated the way. I don't what, know what why would he, he why, why would he yell at you? Just Well, you know, it's a kind of interesting question. But, like, I think we had a different conception of how the eighth note should be played. <laughs> okay. You know? And, like, you know, okay, the way jazz people always quote um, Duke Ellington and saying, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. And that's true. But I would turn that around. I'd flip that and say the, the sensation of meaninglessness is best expressed by music with straight eighth notes. Uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. See, it, it cuts both ways. Anyways, Jack wanted it to mean a thing. And that was not the thing that I meant. And it took me a long time. I took it very personal, you know, because I was in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. I was playing with somebody who had played on real records and whose name people knew. And so I wanted him to like me. Like if this had been a movie, like, you know, he said, yeah, kid, you can really play. But as it was, he just glared at me while I was taking my... And anyways, so I, I took it very personally. But eventually I realized that there were world historical reasons beyond behind the fact that I always rushed and, and was really kind of nervous and, and, and didn't want to mean a thing. Um, yeah, I, and, and then I accepted my own playing more. I mean, because when you, when you listen back to the historical moment when, you know, jump blues and jazz morphed, you know, um, morphed into rock, into earliest rock, the licks are the same. The notes being played are virtually the same. You know, they come from the same uh, vocabulary, but it's a different way of feeling the time. Like in a jazz solo, you feel like the person has all, even if they have just 12 bars, you feel like they have all the time in the world. Yeah. Whereas in a rock solo, even if they go on for 10 minutes, you feel like they're desperate to get to the end, you know, before something terrible happens. Right. 
You know? yeah. So yeah. it's just a different, you know, it's a different kind of sensation of world historical time, really reflected in the playing. Well, that's, you know, anyways. So to get to No Wave, so I'd come down to New York with the intentions of being a jazz player and was having a bit of a difficult time. And so I wound up playing with this band, The Real Tones, which is a, was a kind of, we would have called ourselves R&B purists, but in fact we were a punk R&B band, mm -hmm. um, Brendan, The Real Tones. And we were playing, um, you know, CBGBs, um, uh, the new clubland places that had started to open up in the 80s in New York. Um, so, and we were on a similar, playing similar clubs to the Lizards and all that. Um, so I started to check that out. I started to check out, you know, DNA with Arto Lindsay's yep. and, and Ikawe Mori's band um, and, um, and the Lounge Lizards. And I heard them play and I was like really floored. Um, you first, hadn't I, heard anything like this before? I no, yeah. I hadn't, not really, you know. I mean, I had listened maybe a little bit to Albert Eiler, yeah. um, but I, I don't, I wouldn't say I really got it. I was trying to be a studious jazz musician and there were just miles, you know, there's just miles between the way jazz students approach music and the way actual jazz musicians have approached it, you know, since the free jazz music uh, uh, movement. Yeah. And so no way people were definitely coming out of punk. The, the sense of the aesthetic was punk, but it felt more to me like what Eiler was doing than anything any of the people at the jazz jam sessions I heard were doing. And it was just really strong. I mean, Ardo was playing his totally detuned nine string guitar, not nine strings to expand the range, but a 12 string with three of the strings missing, see? Uh, <laughs> and it sat, made a sound like shattering glass and it was, it was and still is really great. Um, and I said, okay, this is what, you know, this is what I, you know, this is what I dig. And so I got a gig with the Lizards in 84 and I started working with them. And I was also like, you know, I was like seeking, I figured, okay, if you're in New York, find the composers that are in New York, the people who are doing something new. So, you know, I started working with some downtown scene people like Peter Zumo, um, and I started checking out those that set of uh, com composers, um, Daniel Good, Philip Corner. Um, that's the Soho scene at the time. Right. Yeah. You know, um, Gamelon, Son of Lion, uh, <laughs> They had a new music gamelan, um, and and I eventually met Zorn and started working in the late. That was that was really the late '80s. By that time, um, and by that time, it already at the same time like I somehow connected with with Tom Waits and was doing studio stuff that came out of that. So, but the No Wave thing, um, James Chance, yeah, I would say was major on that mm. um yeah. like kind of like demented james brown you know <laughs> um it strikes which me is that his, which might maybe as, as a brave choice like you know music is talked about well it's not very accessible or it's an acquired taste to to get into free jazz and avant-garde jazz people understand straight ahead jazz it's more accessible that's the word that's used so much but accessible to who i mean we were playing I'm telling you, different people need different things at the, mm -hmm. at the, at different times. And when we played with the Lounge Lizards on, you know, we played at APC and clubs like that, like in the basement of a burnt out building on, you know, like, um, I mean, the Lower East Side looked like Berlin, mm -hmm. not even after the war, during the war. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, it was like um, there had been major like the landlords basically burnt the whole place down and it was a huge druggy supermarket and were you living in the um i it's funny i lived cross town on the west side because while i was doing all this i was also had this entirely different life i was like a tenant union activist and um 
so I lived in what wound up as a squatter building <laughs> during most of the 80s uh, on, on West 16th Street, you know, um, and I was doing volunteer housing organ organizing. So, so I was, I had a cheap place to live during that whole time. Um, and so I stayed there. But most of my friends lived in the East Village, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess why, I mean, you know, mainstream music, you know, a lot of musicians say we need to break through to the mainstream, we need a commercial hit. I feel like you've, you've never, that's never been uh, yeah, a goal of Yeah, but not because yours. of bravery, you know, not because of bravery um, at all. Like I say, you know, first of all, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of mythology surrounding music, I, I find it. But, but first of all, m music, for, including getting hits, by the way, is um, it's about niche markets. It's about finding your people and making them, you know, s stand up and shout, you know, <laughs> or dance or, you know, bang their heads or something. So, yeah, y you could say it was non-commercial music, but we... We were packing rooms full of, uh, you know, full of people who were paying and drinking beer and making money. Yeah, yeah.